Go ahead and pray and we'll get started tonight. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to gather together, to, to study your word, uh, to learn more from it. And as we talk tonight about angels and demons, Lord, I pray that we would just, uh, you would open our minds and ears to hear from your word and let that scripture be the foundation of everything that we discuss and think about this evening. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Angels, demons, and Satan. Oh my. What are angels? Why did God create them? How should Christians think about Satan and demons? How should Christians act in regard to the spiritual realm that exists around us? These are some of the things I hope that we can answer tonight as we look at God's word and think about what angels, demons, and Satan are. I guess first things first, I would just say forget about everything you've learned from reading Frank Freddy books or watching Looney Tune cartoons. Remember, these are fictional things. I don't think there's an actual devil sitting on this shoulder here and little angels. Oh, on this shoulder too, but you never know. So... Uh, what are angels? Wayne Grudem's definition in this white book, the Bible doctrine book, is that angels are created spiritual beings with moral judgment and high intelligence, but without physical bodies. So angels are created spiritual beings with moral judgment and high intelligence, but without physical bodies. So first things first, angels are created spiritual beings. They were created by God. Angels haven't always existed. They're part of God's creation. Remember when we talked about creation a couple of weeks ago, we said in the beginning was God. If you look at Colossians 1.16, it says, For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Nehemiah 9.6 says, You, Lord, are the only God. You created the heavens, the highest heavens, with all their stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that are in them. You give life to all of them, and all the stars of heaven worship you. So... Angels are created. They were created to worship God. If you look at Psalm 148, Psalm 148, verses 1 through 6. <laughs> Psalm 48, 1 through 6 talks about creation praising God. It says, Hallelujah, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly armies. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. He set them in position forever and ever. He gave an order that will never pass away. So, hey guys, watching online. So, angels were created to worship God. Can angels be seen? Have you ever seen an angel? They don't have physical bodies. Besides my wife? Oh. They don't have physical bodies? If they don't have physical bodies, how do you see them? Oh. But if they don't have physical bodies, how is it that angels are seen in the Bible? Ooh, are they like holographic, like in Star Trek? If they don't have physical bodies, are they holographic, like in Star Trek? No. I guess it's possible. Ask Mike Norris. He's a rocket engineer. He yeah, we can ask some rocket engineers if they know. But um, they're usually unseen. Angels are usually unseen unless God gave us a special ability to see them. I mean, Scripture is full of situations and circumstances where people had visible and personal personal encounters with angels and with God. Right? Mm -hmm. Jacob wrestled with God. Balaam and his donkey. That donkey saw something. Mm -hmm. 
He saw an angel. So. Well, and the angel that came to Mary. The angel that appeared to Mary. Yeah, scripture is full of encounters with angels. So while they don't have physical bodies, somehow or another, people have seen them before. So uh, what are some other names, other terms for angels? Scripture uses lots of terms for angels, uh, such as sons of God. Scripture refers to the angels as sons of God in the book of Job. Uh, Psalms calls them holy ones. Psalm 89 calls them holy ones. Um, they're called spirits in Hebrews, watchers, thrones. Thrones? Yeah. Watchers, thrones, dominions, principalities. I know thrones seem like a weird word to me, too. Authorities in Colossians, powers in Ephesians. So, sons of God, holy ones, spirits, watchers. Thrones, dominions, principalities, authorities, powers. Those are some of the terms and names for angels that are in the Bible. Uh, now let's talk about types of angels. How many types of angels are there? Or other kinds of heavenly beings? At least four. At least four? I'll go with four. <laughs> there are specific types of heavenly beings listed in scripture. You know, might consider these special types of angels, or some people might think of them as just other types of heavenly beings uh, that are distinct from angels, Groom says, but either way, they are created spiritual beings who serve and worship God. The first one I can think of is the cherubim, right? Mm -hmm. Cherubim. C H E R U B I M, the cherubim. They guarded the entrance to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 24. We see the cherubim guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden. The Bible says that God is enthroned by cherubim. There are actually two cherubim above the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. We see two cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus. Uh, there's the seraphim, seraphim, S-E-R-A-P-H-I-M. These are only mentioned in Isaiah. The seraphim are mentioned in Isaiah. Um, it's going to be Isaiah 6, 2 through 7. I want to read that to us. Isaiah 6. <laughs> they don't get mentioned in Revelation. Uh, we'll get there. Oh, Isaiah 6, 2 through 7 says, Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. And with two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. That's the, that's the seraphim listed in Isaiah. In Revelation chapter 4, all the way to the back of your Bible there, says something similar. Isaiah, or Revelation, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 8 says, Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. So we have the cherubim, we have the seraphim, and we have living creatures. So, living creatures don't get wings. I, well, I guess not, right? Well, they said they had six wings. Oh, six wings. Six wings and a bunch of eyes covered with eyes. Wait, Revelation four. Yeah, that's Revelation four, verse eight. You see that there? Okay, yeah. So, I don't know how many eyes is covered with eyes, but it's got to be more than the two I've got. So. In Isaiah, does it describe them also as a lion, an ox, 
And Isaiah, I don't think it talks about that, about the body of the ox and all that stuff. So, so I don't know if these are just other types of angels or other types of created beings, but that's what else is listed here in God's word. Uh, there's archangels, right? We all know Michael the archangel. I'm assuming there's more than one. Michael's the only archangel, but that shows that there's some tiers of authority, right? And tiers of different levels. He obviously has rule or authority over some of the other angels. Um, you see angelic conflict in Daniel 10. Daniel 10, uh, 10 through 21. There's an angel that gets prohibited from coming to Daniel. He's been trying to get to Daniel. He's been prohibited by the prince of Persia, which I guess we'll get to what the prince of Persia is. But it says there in Daniel 10 that Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help. That's Daniel 10, verse 13. There we see Michael the archangel. So, so we have cherubim, seraphim, living creatures, archangels. How about guardian angels? Your great grandma, your guardian angel? Are there guardian angels? I think so, but I'm aware. Yeah, I've never seen it mentioned in the Bible, but it sure does seem to be a common belief that there are guardian angels. People are always talking about their guardian angel. I don't think it's your dead relative. But if you go to Psalm 91, somebody want to read Psalm 91? 11 and 12. Got it. All right, Sandy, call it up. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Yeah. That happened to me today. I almost stripped you of my ankle. Well, you were watching dogs, so <laughs> it's easy to trip. But God says he's got guardian angels, or he's got angels that he's going to give orders to protect your ways, to support you with their hands so you don't fall. Then Matthew 18, Matthew 18, verses, verse 10. Matthew 18, verse 10 says, See to it that you don't despise one of these little ones, because I tell you that in heaven, their angels, he's talking about kids, their angels continually view the face of my Father in heaven. So obviously, God uses angels to protect us, to watch over us. Keep an eye on us. Keep us safe. So angels do protect us. Does that mean that everybody has a guardian angel? Well, what, four billion of us living today? it would be a lot of angels. The study notes in my Bible suggest that there are angels that are assigned to represent believers to God. So the angels that continually view the face of my father is angels that are assigned to present the needs of believers to God. So, so Crystal's saying that in her study Bible, angels are assigned to believers to watch over the believers, protect them, look out for them. That's what your study notes say. Yeah. So now does that mean that every believer has a guardian angel or an angel to watch over them? Does it mean that all the angels are doing man-to-man -man defense? Or do you think they could be doing some zone defense, you know? I don't need 24-7 coverage. I mean, I sleep 12 hours a day. That's when you need it the most. <laughs> That's when you need the angels the most is when you're sleeping? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Scripture doesn't say whether those angels are with us all the time, watching over us all the time. Maybe there's, you know, an angel that's looking out for you your whole life. Maybe they do kind of zone defense and they're all helping you out. But that kind of leads us to... What the plan is, what, what is the purpose or the plan for, for God's angels, for the angels? What powers do angels have? 
There's obviously some spiritual warfare happening, right? We saw that in scripture. We saw that in Daniel. The angel was prohibited from coming because of the prince of Persia. So they obviously, there's some spiritual warfare happening, some battles that our angels have to fight. Battle against the evil and demonic powers that are under Satan's control. Any powers that angels have would have been given to them by God, right? So whatever authority, whatever power angels have was given to them by God. Scripture tells us here that on earth, as far as us living right now on earth, the angels are higher than us, have more authority and power than we do. But scripture tells us that after we die, when we're in heaven, it says that humans will judge the angels. Well, the tables kind of get switched there. So right now, angels have more authority than we do. When we get to heaven, we will have more authority than angels do. And Jesus always has more authority than everybody. Yeah, Jesus always has the most authority, for sure. So. We've got a special place because... In, and it's over and above the angels because they're looking at us and not understanding why we get such a nice privilege. Sure. Yeah, Sandy's right. We have a very different role than angels do. And in Hebrews 1, it says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So I... Oh, yeah. So the Hebrews said the angels are serving us, Maybe helping those. Maybe the angel angels sent us. You say that I've got a gang of angels? They've got my back? When you're a saint, you're a saint. <laughs> so, so how do angels fit into God's plan? How do they serve his purpose? Well, they worship God, right? We saw that in our scripture readings tonight, that angels worship God. They're praising him. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They're his messengers. They serve as messengers of God. We saw that angel coming to meet with Daniel to talk with him. An angel met with, with Balaam, the donkey, and, and then an angel stopped Paul in his tracks, right? When he was Saul, before he became Paul. So they serve as God's messengers. An angel stopped him? Or was it an angel or was it God? Did I, did I misquote? Which one? Was it God that stopped Paul? Saul was a light. Oh, it was a light. So was it an angel? I don't remember. Yeah. Where Who did knows? that happen? Acts? In the New Testament. Yeah, in the book of Acts. Acts. Yeah, it's in Acts. Paul gets stopped by a giant light. Well, gets blinded. He was blinded by a light. They sing, they wrote a song about it. And uh, so whether that was God or an angel, it was something spiritual. Um Angels show the greatness of God's love and his plan for us. You ever think about that? How angels show the greatness of God's love and his plan for us? Human beings and angels are the only moral, highly intelligent creatures that God has made. Think about that for a second. Human beings and angels are the only moral, highly intelligent creatures that God has made. I really love my dog, and I think he's pretty smart. But Chris will say he's not. He, he not very intelligent. Nope. So he's the smartest dummy I've ever met. Yeah. Absolutely. He's the smartest, weirdest dog. <laughs> but there's a lot that we can understand about God's plan and his love for us when we compare ourselves with angels. And Sandy talked about that a little bit how our roles are different than angels' roles. We were both created by God. We're both created beings, angels and man. But angels were not made in the image of God. Angels weren't made in the image of God. Only man has been made in the image of God. So that's got to show how important we are or how different we are from angels that we were made in the image of God. I wonder if that means they don't have emotion. You think angels don't have emotion? No. I think, I think angels think probably have emotion. I don't know. I've seen any groups. <laughs> They've got to have some sort of emotion or some sort of feelings because. Did you say so? 
Oh, 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 Chris will be through the reading for this week. I can remember. Yeah, if we could all, if I could remember everything, it'd be wonderful. Groom has an opinion on the matter, but a bunch of the angels, we'll find out here in a little bit, rebelled against God, right? And fell away from heaven. So they had to have an opinion or emotion that caused them to like disobey him. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, that's true because Satan was jealous of God, huh? That's yep. why he, yeah, so they have to. Okay. So, and, and talking about the angels falling away, God didn't spare the angels when they sinned. If you look at scripture, God didn't spare the angels mm -hmm. when they sinned and rebelled against God. He kicked them all out of heaven. Now, how's that different from man? We're given the opportunity for salvation. When we sin, if we repent from our sins, we ask for forgiveness, God forgives us our sins when we repent from them. So here's another stark difference there between us and angels. We're made in the image of God. They're not. They are not forgiven where we have the opportunity to be forgiven. I think the emotional part came from the fact that they cheer when somebody gets saved, but also, oh, yeah, also the moral judgment is that part of the emotion. So Sandy's saying that they cheer when people get saved, when people accept Christ, and in the judgment too. So angels remind us that there's an unseen world around us, right? There's a physical and a spiritual realm to the world. It's easy for us to forget that that exists. We're not for angels and demons and, and things like that going on, spiritual warfare happening. They fight those spiritual battles. We don't see them day to day, but we know it's out there. Right. There was no angels in the Saul Paul situation. All right. But there was with the other guy on the donkey. Yeah. The donkey kept smashing his leg up and he kept the donkey. <laughs> That's my bad. I thought maybe every time a donkey, you know, gets upset with somebody, there's an angel. But you're saying not with Paul. Not Saul. With Paul. All right. Fair enough. Angels are examples for us. Angels worship God. We talked about that in the scripture, but have you ever thought about the fact that angels could be worshiping God with us on Sunday mornings? Mm -hmm. If so, I think I might be hearing some of them sing off key. I'm not sure, but... <laughs> But angels worship with us. They could be worshiping with us on Sunday mornings. They worship God. They show us how to worship God. Angels help carry out some of God's plans. Angels are servants of God. They're used by God for our good and for his glory. Everything that angels do directly glorifies God. I guess unless they disobey him, but... We're talking specifically about angels right now. The things that they do glorify God. They serve him. They serve his purposes and his plans. Do you think it's possible that angels at any point in time could decide to turn their back on God and then he casts them out and they become demons? Or do you think it was like a one and done? Like the massive exodus of Angels with bad attitudes and then never again. So you're at Crystal's asking, could do angels still have the opportunity now to rebel against God? Is that an ongoing issue that God's dealing with where every time an angel disobeys them, he has to kick them out? Or was that a one and done thing? We're gonna judge them. I'm sure hope it's one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because if we're judging them, that would imply that at some point they need to be judged. Yeah. I mean, that's a rough. At some point they need to be judged. I don't want that either. So in reading more of what Grudem had to say about angels and demons, his take on it was, you know, in the beginning we see in creation, God created everything and it was good. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden we see sin in the world and in the fall. Mm -hmm. So his take on it was somewhere between God creating everything and it being good in the fall is when the rebellion happened. Mm. He's saying, the God said, look, everything's great. Then all of a sudden, sin. So he's saying after creation is when the rebellion happened. 
Does he talk about the random sons of God that were like big and they were procreating with the daughters of men in the he does not talk about that. About sons of God listed in Genesis. Nephilim? So, yeah. Yeah, sons of God in the Nephilim. We discussed leaving the tough questions for when Dr. Catherine's here <laughs> and not. I'm just we discussed, discussed, like, yeah, I'm not this guy. guy. No. But I don't know about the account in Genesis, but we already discussed this morning or this evening earlier that sons of God sometimes is referred to angels. Right. So that gets confusing there. So. That's a great follow-up question for next week. I will say that. <laughs> I'm not sure on that. That's, that's something I've wanted to study more myself. But let's talk about angels and us. Let's talk about how we interact with one another. You ever thought about the fact that angels are part of our daily lives? You ever see angels on your commute into work in the morning? Maybe. I, sure I see some demons on the road, right? No. <laughs> But angels are part of our daily lives. Angels interact with us. The Bible tells us that angels observe our actions. Hello. They watch what we're doing. They see what we're doing. They see our obedience to God. But they also witness our disobedience to him. But they can't hear our thoughts. Only God can do that, right? They can't hear our thoughts, Crystal says. No. Crystal asks. Crystal asks. Can they hear our thoughts? Uh, I'm going to cover that here in a minute, too. Okay. So, yeah. I don't, angels can't hear our thoughts, but they see our actions. They can hear our phone calls. They can see our text messages, I guess, if you're looking over the shoulder. <laughs> they have better eyesight than I do. So, Sandy quoted Hebrews earlier. Hebrews 13 2 says, Don't neglect to show hospitality. For in doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. If you grew up in the 90s, you heard the New York Newsboy song, Entertaining Angels. Mm -hmm. So we entertain angels unaware. We interact with angels. So do they have physical bodies in those situations? How does that work? Either way, the Bible says that we have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. We also need to be cautious. When interacting with angels, we need to be on alert. Are we supposed to worship angels? No. Are we supposed to pray to them no. or seek them? Are we looking out for angels, trying to find them, like ghost hunters or something? Nope. Nope. No, we don't worship angels. We don't pray to them. We don't seek them. Why? Because they're created beings, right? They're not God. We see where John sees an angel and interacts with an angel and starts to bow down to him. The angel says, don't worship me. I'm not God. So <clears throat> we should only pray. There's a couple places in the Old Testament where that happens too. Yeah. We should only pray to God and God alone. We don't pray to angels. We don't pray to saints. Now, hold on. What about <laughs> in Sodom and Gomorrah when the angels come... And the men in the town are trying to raise them. They haven't been in physical bodies. Right. So in Sodom and Gomorrah, a couple of angels roll up into town. So where they actually have physical bodies or they have the appearance of having a physical body. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm entertaining an angel, as it says in Hebrews, I'm going to see something. That's so. true. And they didn't demand worship. They didn't demand worship, but no, she's going back to the physical body like, thing. She's yeah. stuck on that. No, oh, I don't have that <laughs> so I have patients that claim that I should listen to them because they have angelic. <laughs> All right, <laughs> well, we got to be cautious, we got to be careful. Does somebody want to look up Second Corinthians 11? Verses 3 through 15. Second Corinthians 11, 3 through 15. It's kind of a longer one. I've got it. Ooh, Robbie's got it. Shout it out, Robbie. <clears throat> Sorry, you said 3 through 15? Yeah, Second Corinthians 11, verses 3 through 15. It's a little... Perfect. Um, <clears throat> but I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be... Uh, seduced 
from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if a person comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we do not preach, or you receive a different spirit, which you had not received, or a different gospel, which you had not accepted, you put up with it splendidly. Now, I consider myself in no way inferior to those super apostles, even if I am untrained in public speaking, I am certainly not untrained in knowledge. Indeed, we have in every way made that uh, clear to you in everything. Or did I commit a sin by humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by taking pay from them to minister to you. When I was uh, present with you and in need, I did not burden anyone since the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. I have kept myself and will keep myself from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, the boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of uh, Achaia. <clears throat> Why? Because I do, or because I don't love you. Uh, God knows I do. Excuse me. Why? Because I don't love you. Need to correct that inflection there. Uh, God knows I do. But I will continue to do what I am doing in order to deny an opportunity to those who want to be regarded as our equals and what they boast about. For such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no great surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will be according to their works. Perfect. So I know that's a pretty big, large block of text there, but I wanted you to see in the beginning there where Paul's talking about the serpent deceiving Eve, be, Eve being cunning, that her mind was seduced from a sincere, pure devotion to Christ. He says, if a person comes and preaches another Jesus that we didn't preach, we receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, you've not accepted it, you put up, you know, and then he comes back down at the end of that and talks about false teachers, false apostles. So the devil doesn't come to your door with a pitchfork and a red robe, right? He comes as an angel of light. If you look over a couple pages at Galatians 1, a couple pages over in your Bible, Galatians 1, 8 says, but even if we... Or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse beyond him. So even if you see an angel, he says, hey, I'm an angel. I'm here to share you, with you something. And it's contrary to God's word. What do we do? Yeah, we're an angel's demons. I would hope that we would reject it. But obviously that's not always the case. As we've seen world religions pop up based off. An encounter with an angel and following what that angel said. So is it possible if they get the chapter read to rebel against God? Well, correct. But angels serving God and everything an angel does glorifies God becomes shares me a message, it should line up with scripture. If an angel comes and shares something that's contrary to what Paul's preaching here in 2 Corinthians. He's not joining anymore. Obviously. No, no, contrary to God's Funny. word. So. Does that make sense? Yes. Everybody with me? Here. So, talking about angels bringing contrary messages to God's word that people follow and obey. It leads us to our next category. Angels and demons. Okay. What are demons? Demons are angels who have sinned, angels who have disobeyed God. God didn't create two types of angels. At creation, there wasn't the blood and the crypts. Like, <laughs> there was just angels. So the demons are the angels that disobeyed God. <laughs> demons are evil angels who have sinned against him. Now they work to continually orchestrate evil in the world. Who's the head of all these demons? Satan. Is it Satan? Is it Satan? The only time when Jesus is in the answer, right here, Satan. Satan is the head of the demons. Satan is a Hebrew word meaning adversary. Obviously, there are other names for Satan. We heard Sandy say one, Beelzebul. 
Beelzebub. Wayne Gruden said Beelzebub, lift off the B. I thought there's going to be a B at the end there, right? So I think there's two. Beelzebub, Beelzebub. Yeah, Beelzebub and Beelzebub. I feel like I have your name spelled wrong for all eternity. <laughs> no. I would imagine they each mean something very similar but different in the Yeah, right? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's a bad one. But there's other names for Satan. He's called the devil. He's called the serpent. Beelzebub, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the evil one. Nope. Never good names. I'll tell you that much. Demonic activity. There's demonic activity, right? Satan's the originator of sin. His main goal is to create sin, cause sin to happen, and tempt others to sin. We see that from the very beginning in Genesis 3. And Satan's there interfering with everything, causing people to sin. Demons oppress and try to destroy every work of God. They use lies deception, murder, every other kind of destructive activity to attempt people to cause them to turn away from God and to destroy themselves. Demons will do everything they can to blind people to the gospel. Can demons actively murder people or do they just use people to murder people? Can demons actively murder people or use people to murder people? It's a great question. We're going to talk about demon possession what? in a little bit. Crystal wants well, to know. Can, Go ahead. can we differentiate between murder and just kill? I mean, murder and kill. <laughs> can we differentiate between well, murder and kill? And the reason I'd say that is because um, you look in Revelations and there's a lot of people dying, but that's at um, God's direction versus, in my mind, murder would be against God's will. Right. So, are people being murdered against God's will, or is God wiping out of people as part of his judgment? So, we'll come back to that here in a second. Second. Wait, 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 wait. I, I need to understand. So, what we're saying, what Mike is saying is we need to differentiate between murder and kill. And if murder is killing but is against God's will, is that what he said? That's what I, that's what I am implying, yes. But okay. by the use of that word versus killing somebody at God's direction. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. So can demons physically kill someone if or is it through only through possession? A great question. We're going to get there. Can they kill people or is it only two possessions? Um, we'll come to that. Um, but they use all these different destructive activities to attempt people to destroy themselves and turn away from God, to do everything they can to blind people from the gospel. They use temptation, doubt, fear, guilt, confusion, sickness, envy, pride, slander. Basically, any means possible to hinder a Christian's witness and their usefulness to God. I think about the identity crisis going on in the world today. People that are rejecting how God's made them. You know, being made in the image of God and, and what he's created them to be. We see in Romans that God delivers people over to a corrupt, corrupt mind. And I have to believe that demons are involved in this process of causing confusion and different things to hinder people in their relationship to God to blind them from the gospel. Luckily, James 4, 7 says, if we resist the devil, he will flee from us, right? So to answer your question, Crystal, demons are limited by God's control and have limited power. So anything that the demons do work in has to under God's authority. Hence why Mike is making the distinction between kill and murder. Hence the distinction between kill and murder. Okay, I get it now. If you look at the book of Job, we see God allowing Satan to tempt Job to, to work in his life, to cause chaos to happen. 
Right. Right. God allowed that to happen. But demons can't just <laughs> mess with us voting. Right. God is sovereign. God is in control. He has authority over all creation. Peter's life. Jesus says to Peter, I hope when the devil's done sifting you, that you will persevere. God says, Jesus says, I'm praying for you. So are demons omnipresent? Is Satan omnipresent? Is he everywhere? No. He can't the angels aren't. Angels aren't everywhere. Demons aren't everywhere. Ooh, do we get our own guardian demon? I don't know why it sounded so That's excited about that. I don't know that there is a demon in charge messing with your life <laughs> all day, every day. We're a third of them are thrown. A third of us into hell. So one in three of us. If we're going to start counting angels, we're going to be way over my head because math is not <laughs> my strong point. Interesting. But they're created beings, so they're not omnipresent. Right. Satan isn't everywhere. They're not omniscient. They're not omniscient. They're not all knowing. They don't know the future. Right. They don't see everything. They don't hear our thoughts. They don't hear what goes on in our mind. That's interesting. So the end times is just as much a mystery to them as it is to us. The end of the world is just as much mystery to them as it is to us. So I grew up in a Pentecostal church and I had somebody tell me once that I had to pray in tongues so that the angels wouldn't hear me. And I thought, well, if I'm praying in a spiritual language, wouldn't they know the same spiritual language? Yeah. So they can hear us. They can interact with us. They can see what we're doing. But they don't hear our thoughts. They don't know everything. Angels don't know everything either. Only God does. Only God knows everything. So if demons don't know everything, angels don't know everything, and Satan doesn't know everything, then what about witch doctors, fortune tellers, Demonic influence. I have a question. How does that work? Yes, Sandy, what is your question? Second Peter 2 4. Okay. It was one of the first things in Drew's book. Second Peter 2 4. That says that if God didn't spare angels when they sinned, he sent them to hell. Putting them in gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. How can they be in gloomy dungeons in chains? Or did I read chains? Yeah, so in the CSB it says, For if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and delivered them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment. That's what that verse says. So deliver so, them in chains. So how can they be so vibrant if they're sitting down in the gloomy darkness and change so they get out once in a while so once again not the doctor here tonight i'll try to keep my heresy at a minimum but i don't know if that's talking about right now or talking about future judgment um, they obviously are bound by god's authority and what he allows them and you know prohibits them from doing so but, but yeah, they're, they're obviously here. We see demonic influence in the world. There's obviously evil in the world. I don't feel like we're living in a world without evil. So something's happening. So. But as far as witch doctors, fortune tellers, different things like that, where people think they're psychic and can tell your future, I'd have to think that part of that would be from... Angels and demons observing us, seeing things happening, hearing our conversations. So, demons interact with the world the same way that angels do. So, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, now what? I had a question in here Are demons active in the world today? I think it was a good question based on Sandy's question out of Second Peter. I think the angels and demons are active in the world today. I believe we see demons just as active in the world today, angels and demons both, as they were in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, not all evil and sin that occurs in the world is from Satan and demons. 
obviously it's because of Satan and the demons that sin is in the world. But is every sin that happens every, every time you mess up or everything that you do, is that because of Satan and the demons? If I'm snappy with my wife, is it because the devil made me do it? We talked about how there's four billion people on the earth and only one Satan. It's hard for me to imagine the devil's pestering me, bugging me all the time. If I'm short-tempered with my family, is there a good chance I was maybe just hangry? Or is it always because of demons and Satan and all that? Are you, ask, are you asking for an answer? No, I think he wants us to say, I can't imagine you ever being angry. I know. I personally am insane, and it's hard for anyone to imagine me screwing up. But something to think about, you know. Obviously, we, we are a distorted image of God, right? We were made in God's image, but we were born with a sinful nature. So we are inclined to act based on that sinful nature. But I don't know that everything that I do is always because a, a demon or Satan is messing with me or just because sin is in the world. That being said, can a Christian be demon-possessed? That was kind of Crystal's question earlier. Can a demon possess me and cause me to murder someone? Well, not me. I know they can't possess me because I'm a Christian. So. Right. so. But a non-Christian, you're saying, maybe could be right. possessed. Okay. Well, no, I know that a demon can possess a human being and cause them to kill another human being. What I'm asking is, can the spiritual form, the non-physical form of a demon, walk into a room unseen I and you. kill a human being? Like Darth Vader you to death or something. Yeah, just Darth Vader you to death. I doubt it. I would, I would think that they would use people. But as far as can a Christian be demon-possessed, uh, the Greek word there in the New Testament is something I can't pronounce. Demonizomi. You're going to spell it as D-A-I-M-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. -I -I. Talks about Christians suffering from demonic influence, things like demonic attacks, conflicts with demons. Christians can be influenced by the devil, right? The devil tried to tempt Jesus. We see that. Demon possession or demonized, give, those words give the nuance of such strong demonic influence that they seem to imply that the person who's under demonic attack has no choice but to succumb to it. Well, I don't think that's true for the Christian. I think it's possible in extreme cases. Gurdon talks about the uh, demonic uh, situation, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. But can a Christian be completely dominated by a demon? Romans 6.14 says that sin has no dominion over us since we've been raised with Christ, right? The Holy Spirit lives in us. There might be different degrees of demonic attacks, demonic influence in our lives and the lives of the believers. But the Bible says we can rebuke the demon in the name of Jesus and can command it to leave. You guys all with me? Mm -hmm. Jesus gives all believers authority to rebuke demons and command them to leave. So we have the authority to reject Satan, just like Jesus had the authority in his human nature to reject Satan and tell him to leave. At the end of the day, because of Christ's death on the cross, Satan was defeated at the cross. Satan was defeated at the cross. Because of Christ's death on the cross, our sins are completely forgiven. And as a result, Satan has no rightful authority over us. We are God's own children. We need not fear demons. 1 John 4, 4. <clears throat> First John 4, 4 says, you are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The Holy Spirit in us is greater than he that is in the world. 
And then Second Timothy, Second Timothy 1 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. You ever heard that voice before? God has not given us a spirit of fear. Satan's main weapon is fear. Satan uses fear against us. If you look at Ephesians, let's look at Ephesians. I love the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6, starting verse 10, says, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil, spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand therefore with truth, like a belt around your waist, righteousness, like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. Verse 16 says, in every situation, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then he says in verse 18, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. So Satan's main weapon is fear. God tells us here in Ephesians how to fight against it, how to resist the devil. Put on the full armor of God, he says, right? Put on the full armor of God. If we're not wearing all the armor of God, there's some kinks in our armor, some holes, some opportunities that maybe Satan can attack us or take us down. Uh, if I if I may, um, Milton Vincent has a book called The Gospel Primer, which I believe you and Brian shared with me. And there's a section in it when he's going through, like I think, 31 reasons why we need to rehearse the gospel daily. And one of those reasons is based on... Uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through uh, what we just read, 10 through 18. And he makes a really cool connection in the fact that uh, every piece of the, um, the armor of God uh, relates back to the gospel in some way, shape, or form. And so it's, it's just the, I just figured I'd share that and that it's just really cool how it all comes back to the gospel. Absolutely. Well, that's really good. I love that gospel primer book. That's a really helpful tool. What's it called? It's called A Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent, right? Milton Vincent? Vincent, yeah. Yeah. So A Gospel Primer. It's just a small little book to kind of, it's a little devotional book. It's really good. So we're going to put on the full armor, God, to resist the devil. Our power to cast out demons does not come from our own strength or power, but from what? From the Holy Spirit, right? In Matthew 12, uh, 22 through 32, Matthew 12, 22 through 32, Jesus talks about a kingdom divided, right? The Pharisees, or Pharisees accuse him of casting out demons by demons. He says, how can I cast out demons by demons? It's the power of God that casts out evil. It's the light that blocks out the darkness. So our power, our, our strength, anything that we have to cast out demons, to resist the devil comes from God. So scripture tells us don't result, don't rejoice in our power over the demons, but rejoice in our salvation, right? What's more important, that the demons are afraid of you or that you're saved and that you have eternal life? Saved and eternal life. Yeah, saved and eternal life, right? That's what's more important. There is one statement in here, and I don't know if that's what you just said. At times, we may also decide to directly speak to an evil spirit, commanding it to leave in the name of Jesus. But I thought we were told, don't speak to a demon. Let Jesus speak to the demon. And then when it says, pray in the spirit, 
let the Holy Spirit do the demon speaking and we just get out of there and run. I'm asking. Sure. This is this is against what I've been taught. Well, like we talk about every week, the stuff in Gruden's books aren't necessarily canon. It's commentary on the canon, right? Yes. So we have to interpret that as best we can. Same with the creation account we discussed a few weeks ago. Not everything in there is crystal clear. We're, we're going to have different viewpoints on it, different theories. I remember being told by somebody once, you can't bind Satan and then cast him out. Because if he's bound, they can't go anywhere. <laughs> and I feel like that's getting too into the, the weeds a little bit. James. Yeah, he found James and right. So James 4 says that we need to resist the devil and he'll flee from us. So, um, and then you see Jesus casting out demons and it's not by demons. So it's not us that does the work, it's the Holy Spirit. So if I say, get behind me, Satan, like, is it Paul that says that? Get behind me, Satan. You know, well, get away from me. Point, there's the person Jesus. that's demon possessed after... After Jesus' ascension, there is a person that's demon possessed, and Paul, no, Peter, and another guy. So, a bunch of people come and they go, We tried to cast the demon out of this guy, and it wouldn't work. Basically, the demon says, Jesus, I know. Paul, I've heard of. Who are you? And then, or Peter, I've heard of one of them, anyhow. And then they end up, the apostles end up going and casting the demon out of the person. So even after Jesus is mentioned, there's people casting demons out. Yeah. And healing. Right. So whether they go and casting demons out is saying, like, you like, get out of here in the name of Jesus, right? So whether they go up and they pray that Jesus will remove the demon, or they go up and say, with the power and authority of Christ, I command you, causing the demons to leave, it, it never says one way or the other. It just says that they cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Yeah. So it's kind of vague, honestly. I, I feel like either way, whether you go, whether you say, Jesus remove this demonic presence from me, or in the name of Jesus, I, I command you to get behind me. I think either way the point is don't entertain me. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, and that's why my encouragement at the beginning of this is anytime that we're going to examine uh, a topic in scripture, as we're studying it systematically, I feel like it's hard to kind of put off things we've heard from the past, the things we've learned. Mm -hmm. I remember growing up as a young Christian, I just figured whatever the pastor said, that was going to be the most accurate. Because I'm like, that guy's probably gone to school. He's probably read his Bible more than I have. He's going to know everything. And then as I studied my Bible and read it like the Bereans did, I realized, hey, that guy got, got some stuff wrong. So um, kind of try to put off that kind of stuff and really look at scripture and examine it. Um, hopefully, Pastor Brian will post some more about this topic here on Realm since he wasn't able to be with us tonight. Um, I think Crystal's right. I think at the end of the day, it, it's prayer. It's turning to Jesus, right? Asking for him for help. We talked about how God is in authority over everything. God controls everything. We, we saw where he allowed Satan to meddle in Job's life. So if, if the devil's messing with you and he's saying, hey, God, help me resist the devil. Help me get through this. I think that's helpful. If you say, hey, Satan, get back away from me, leave me alone, I think that's helpful. Even if it's not actually Satan that's messing with you, even if it's a demon, if you're just saying, hey, get out of here, man. I'm a child of God, so I belong to him. I think that's important. At the end of the day, we should expect the gospel to come in power and in triumph over the works of the devil. In this white book, John Grudem, or Wayne Grudem, ends this chapter by saying, if we believe that the reason of the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil, which it says in 1 John 3, 8, that God appeared to destroy the works of the devil, then it would seem appropriate to expect that even today, when the gospel is proclaimed to unbelievers, and when prayer is made for believers who have been unaware of this dimension of spiritual conflict, there will be a genuine 
an often immediately recognizable triumph over the power of the enemy. We should expect that this would happen and think of it as a normal part of the work of Christ in building up his kingdom and rejoice in Christ's victory in it. Excuse me, sorry. Okay, but I say that at the end of the day, we should be rejoicing with the work that Christ is doing, the lives that are being changed, right? Look at what God's doing. Look at the people that are being called to him, the lives that are being changed. We don't know a lot about angels and demons because they're not the main character. They're not the main character of the story. They're a supporting role in the story of God's redemptive glory. And at the end of the day, God is just as sovereign and in control of them as he is of us. So if we don't need to worry about them and his doing, then, you know, somebody who's, I don't know, a thousand miles away that we've never met, they can still be yeah, God is in control. God is the main character, and God is where our focus needs to rest. As we're studying through things systematically, it's easy to get caught up in the weeds, right? When I talk about creation, we can get caught up in young earth, old earth. We can get caught up in the right way to pray and, and what the exact role angels and demons have. But our main focus needs to be on God and kind of forget about the rest or think about it less. That's pretty much all I have. Any questions tonight? Any questions online? Anybody still awake online? We're here. Awesome. Still here. I'll just close with this. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. At the end of the day, I think that's what's important, is drawing near to God. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you.